Welcome to today's webinar. This is part four in my Evolving Your Remote First Workflow series. Uh, today's session is security and compliance for your, for your remote workforce, everything you must know. My name is Andrew Rigg. I'm a solutions architect at Perfect Image, and my focus is around public cloud, specifically Microsoft Azure, AWS, and Microsoft 365. Perfect Image is a managed service provider located in the northeast of the UK. We're a consultancy-led business with over 90 IT professionals across three business units, uh, covering business intelligence, business systems, and IT infrastructure. As the global situation continues to change and evolve, we need to allow teams and businesses to adapt rapidly. The change has become, has, has been an intense pace in, in, in the recent months. Now is the time to proactively plan and prepare for the second half of the year. As we've seen firsthand, solutions such as Microsoft Teams and Windows Virtual Desktop have become invaluable over the last few months and has really enabled the remote workforce. These, these solutions will continue to, continue to have an important role as we start to return workforces to the offices, but continue as a remote first workforce. Today, I'll try to squeeze in all the topics on screen into around a 45 minute slot. Please ask questions throughout um, and I, as I'll be checking as we go. If you'd like any further information or a dedicated session around any of these topics, please get in touch. Do any of these sound familiar? Paper-based files, you know, inconvenient, not secure when taking them home. For GDPR, you have limited control over what's done with them. You, you may have had to scan them to email, you know, and, and email them around to multiple employees. Or someone's taken them home, uh, them home and no one else now has access. You can't share paper like you can share an electronic document, either that be it on screen or via email with a link to the original document. You don't want multiple copies. And you know, what's the current version? And what if it's lost? You can't co-author a paper-based file. When you have an on-premise phone system, you know, um, you've moved to remote working, whether temporary or permanent, what do your staff do? It's unfair and unprofessional to ask them to use their personal devices. Big physical desktops are more than inconvenient. They take up a lot of space and users can't take them home at the end of the day if they need to work remotely the following day. We also saw a lot of businesses reporting the use of memory sticks and hard drives, taking copies from file servers. This is a huge risk to data leakage and greatly increases the risk of a breach. Many questionable GDPR related activities in the early stages of lockdown were happening. Many out of necessity to keep the business running. If this was occurring in your, in your business, my question is, have you put a stop to this now? Has all the actions been taken to ensure your data is safe? You know, what systems have you put in place to ensure that type of activity is blocked and reported on? Do you have controls and systems in place to be able to manage your data and those, and those devices remotely? Are your staff still using personal computers or have they been supplied with a temporary device to allow them to work from home? If the answer is yes, then do you have those systems in place to ensure that you know, and, and enforce these devices that are encrypted, secured and compliant. Does your current remote working solution align with GDPR requirements? The Information and Commissioner's Office, you know, ICO, has signaled that it will take the current circumstances into account when considering enforcement action under GDPR. However, the ICO will still expect employers to take the appropriate action to protect the information they're responsible for, even when they staff working from home. These are some of the considerations when working from home. Use work provided devices to store and access information where possible. Avoid storing information on personal devices and they're also authorized to do so and devices can be managed, secured and encrypted. Don't forget to tidy up papers and lock devices away at the end of the day. If printing is enabled, make sure any confidential documents are in secure storage and are shredded if no longer in use. Papers that can't be securely disposed of should be secured until they can be returned to the workplace for secure storage or destruction. Position screens and papers so they can't be read by others. In data protection terms, family members are just a third party, you know, whom information should not be disclosed. Do not be tempted to show interesting work or information to, to family members or others in your house. This would constitute as unauthorized disclosure in data protection terms. Don't use work devices to do personal internet browsing you know, or conduct other personal business unless authorized to do so. 
uh, you don't connect these devices to networks unless they're subject to you know suitable security as set out in your relevant security policies that's quite difficult to do for you know home networks to protect your your, your own privacy dis um, disable cameras and audio devices if not necessary you know um, if they're not necessary lock the devices when they're not in use Stick to the usual rules when sharing information with third party organizations, you know, encrypting attachments, verifying recipient details. In the next couple of slides, I'll discuss how you can prevent this type of activity from occurring and what tools you can use to protect your data. This is what people normally think backups for. But people are your greatest risk. This could be unintentional deletion, a deletion you know, by mistake. Uh, it could be hacking or ransomware. It's not uncommon to see, a, uh, to see malicious acti activity from a bad leaver who's been deleting data over time. If you're using a SaaS solution like Office 365, in this case, the standard retention policies and recycle bins are of no use, and the SaaS provider will no longer be able to restore your data because the time has, has passed on, the, on, on, on those retentions the data will be gone forever. So your staff are your biggest threat to cybersecurity. Think who clicks on risky email links, you know, opens dangerous attachments from unknown senders, or downloads unsafe programs. You're not around to help them, they're at home alone. It's better to prepare for, for a cyber attack than trying to recover after your company is attacked. Successful cybersecurity practices depend on creating a culture of security awareness. User awareness training can assist in keeping uh, staff aware of the ever-changing threats and inf informed and on high alert. Train your users you know, how to recognize phishing and spoofing attacks. So when they receive an email that looks even slightly suspicious, they know what to do you know, or, or who to contact. Train staff to search for a le legitimate website instead of clicking on a link for those slightly suspicious emails. You know, training should not be seen as a penalty Educate first and test after. If you test first, it will feel like a punishment. So train then test. Fish your own users. You know, test them with third-party products that produce real-world look-alike attacks. A common approach, you know, is for training is to turn it into a game. At PI, we often get emails, you know, from Microsoft asking for our login details or from our CEO asking us to review the attached document. Some of these are, are, are legitimate threats. Um, you know, um, and, and others are phishing cam campaigns. Some can be user awareness campaigns. It keeps us on our toes and highlights the teams and the users at risk. Make sure you're able to report you know, and, um, on, and on any education and testing material. You need to know, you know, you need to know if it's if it's of value, you know, value for money and effective. Once, once you've sent staff the phishing email, you need to see how many people read them how many click on the links and how many report them to your IT support teams. I myself has just been sent one of these HM, HMRC scams. It was just on the weekend, I think it was. You know, there are multiple uh, COVID-19 financial support uh, scams you know, circulating at the moment. You know, criminals are sending fake government emails designed to look like they're from government departments offering grants of up to seven and a half thousand pounds. There's also targeted lockdown scams where criminals are sending fake emails uh, and texts claiming to be from TV licensing, telling people they're eligible for six months free TV license because of the coronavirus pandemic. Also amid the rise of online TV subscription services during lockdown, customers have been targeted um, via, by sending convincing emails, ask them to update their payment details by clicking on a link and then steal their credit card information. The native recovery option alone you know, for SaaS, SaaS services, for, you know, for your recovery time objectives or recovery point objectives may not meet your requirements. Part of your responsibility is to protect your data and even Microsoft recommends using a third party provider in their SLAs. There are hundreds of third party solutions available, uh, but Perfect Image has partnered with Datto to provide options for our customers. So what's protected? In a nutshell, email, SharePoint, OneDrive and Teams data, um, it, it's, it, it's all protected. You can choose from infinite or time-based retention options. You know, time-based is typically 12 months, but backups are every three days. 
sorry, every <laughs> backups occur three times per day, you know, roughly every eight hours. But this depends upon Microsoft workloads at that time. The costs start, they, they can start as little as two pounds per user per month. We've already seen our cyber criminals are using people work from home on unsecured networks and devices as a perfect opportunity to, to hack fish and scam. For those using VPNs, you know how useful they are to get access to company resources. The drawback is they don't enforce the same data security regulations and policies that were once in place when you're in the safe confines of the office network. All it will take is one breach or near miss for businesses to review how data security is enforced um, via for remote workers. Cyber criminals are going after users in increasingly sophisticated ways. You know, phishing attacks are getting harder and harder to recognize. Ransomware that twists the power of encryption to work against you. Social engineering attacks. So these are ones we kind of spoke about earlier. You know, take advantage of people being busier. There's, it's been reported there's been a 20% rise in cyber attacks since the, since the pandemic began. Years ago, having an internet firewall, PC antivirus, you know, email filtering and backup was sufficient to protect your business. Typically your office, you know, all your buildings, four walls were the first perimeter and attack had to be in the building to gain access to your network. With users' identity and data moving to the cloud, uh, in, in increased mobile access and cyber criminals getting more and more sophisticated, times have changed. But has your business changed with the times? With users' identity and data now in the cloud, rather than being, at, being inside, your, you know, in, inside your location on a network you control, the, the attack surface has increased and more points of risk to consider. Users are using more and more mobile devices. They're working from home, you know, coffee shops, airports and airplanes, well, they used to a couple of months ago. Let's see what happens in a few more months. You know, the challenge for you know, the small and medium businesses you know, is you don't have the time to become a cybersecurity ex expert. You don't have the time to stay a cybersecurity expert because how the threats change on a month to month. Now, up on the screen are six of the most popular 365 plans. Going, um, going back to the first webinar of the series, we discussed licensing in detail. I only bring this up again as, as the next set of slides discussing security will depend upon what license you have. If you have a Microsoft Business Standard, which was the old Office 365 Business Premium, or Office 365 E3, and not the EMS E3 component, you won't have the right license to access all of the security and compliance features I'm about to discuss. Licensing can be confusing. There's now over 20 different Microsoft and Office 365 plans, and there's about another 70 to 80 add-on licenses. This is where Perfect Image can work with you to choose the right plan and the right license for your business. I just want to point out that the chart on screen is only a section of the full comparison, but points out some of the most common requirements or requests of licenses. I'll just pause for a moment and just check if there are any questions coming through. Okay, so just one here. So uh, what are the limits of using Microsoft 365 Business Premium? Well, yeah, this one here, it's a, it's a great value license with, you know, when comparing it to your know, Office 365 E3 and, and EMS E3. But what we suggest for this one is, I would suggest this license for any SMB, um, you know, you, you kind of use it for under 300 users. You know, it's, it's, it's the most, it's the most valuable, right, in terms of productivity, security, and compliance features as a common license and bundles. You know, so Office 365 and EMS is a typical bundle we see, but using the M365 Business Premium, you save around seven pounds per user per month, and it ticks just about all boxes those kind of users need. Um, just, just to add to that, the, the 300 users, that is typically um, based upon because you're allowed 300 licenses per tenancy for that subscription before you need to move over to the likes of M365 E3. But you don't have to license all those users for the for the next tier up. So you can have 300 of the business premium and five of the Microsoft 365 E3 if you have 300 or five users. 
So we're going to talk about the Microsoft 365 solution that allows you to ensure yeah, you're secure and compliant for your data, devices, and applications, you know, user identity using the 365 licensing. So firstly, we'll discuss Intune, right? So it can be configured for both device management and application management. When Intune is used for device management for Windows 10 devices, you create both device compliance policies that are used to manage the device, you know, no matter where they are, you know, and what internet connection it has. By creating the device configuration policy that enforces BitLocker, you know, maybe sets power schedules, uh, deploys applications such as your antivirus, you then create a compliance policy that matches that configuration. So for the compliance side, you say, so it requires BitLocker, must have endpoint protections, firewalls must be enabled. You, know, you can make these as complex as, as you like or require. You know, this was just a very simple example. You can then link the device compliance status to conditional access policies. So more on conditional access policies shortly in the upcoming slides. But doing this will ensure that users connect, you know, users are connecting with a trusted, managed, secured, and compliant device in the first place, and, and deny access to any user with a non-compliant device. The configuration and compliance policies, you know, say, can be configured to just to, to suit your requirement, you know, and target the group of users you're targeting. So whether you're targeting a group of users for, for you know, finance and targeting particular applications, uh, hey, HR, sales. So devices can be managed in two ways as well. So you've got corporate and personal. If you have a bring your own device policy, um, or users use their own phones and tablets, uh, computers, you know, for, for the likes of 365 services for email and OneDrive, to prevent data leakage on the personal devices, you should put a policy in place that requires the users to enroll that device into Intune. So how does that work? So you create, you'd create a policy that enforces the user to enroll the device into Intune if they want to access any company applications and resources. You know, otherwise their login attempt will be blocked. So if it's a personal device, then the business applications are effectively in a bubble. You know, if the device is lost, stolen, or you have a bad lever, you can enforce a remote wipe of the applications and the data without affecting the personal data on that device. If the company supplied a uh, you know, device, um, then you have more controlled in more control. So depending upon the device itself, right? So to you, know, you can enforce a complete remote wipe or you can set it to an out of the box setting ready for the next user. What makes a device company versus personal? Generates how the device is enrolled into Intune. If it's user initiated, so you those personal devices, then it's deemed personal. If it's automated by items such as, you know, autopilot or by um, via Active Directory, a group policies to enroll the devices automatically, then it will be marked as corporate. Settings for devices can be changed at a later date if required by the Intune administ administrator. So securing your identity. So zero trust is a methodology used you know, you know, when protecting your data and resources. This assumes that the user's credentials are already compromised. So here's an example. A user is trying to access an application knowing who's requesting access is essential. Validate the user's identity explicitly. Don't infer from the environment. So whether a user logs in from a coffee shop or inside the network, verify them in real time before they're granted access. Use strong authentication, you know, such as Microsoft Authenticate, the Authenticator app for MFA. You know, add threat intelligence, but also factor in components such as the device health, you know, its compliance status, application behavior, organizational policies, you know, and, um, and, and data labels before you grant access to corporate resources. So let's have a look at the technologies that can help defend you know, these components in your digital estate, starting with identity and access manager. So how do you protect the user's identity? The number one thing you can do is implement MFA for all users. So MFA, multi-factor authentication, sometimes referred to as 2FA, two-factor authentication. Um, so you need to assume that the user's compromise, um, you know, you need to assume that the user's credentials have already been compromised. So, you know, an example of that, you know, Ashley Madison, so 
few years back now, but people were using the work accounts to hide their activities from partners. But when the data breach occurred, many passwords were in common with 365 accounts. You know, awesome targeted phishing cam campaigns were enough to gain access to those 365 accounts. Now, typically users have about three passwords that they use for, for all accounts, just, just, just as, a, as a figure. But if MFA was enforced, then over 99% of those attackers wouldn't have been able to gain access. So MFA offerings aren't equal. So user-based MFA is, the, is seen as a legacy MFA. It's either on or it's off versus those conditional access policies where you can be granular and enforce these across your organization. So I'll give you a couple of examples of what a conditional access policy is. So if we create a policy that enforces MFA, so it requires MFA for a group of users that are added to a security group called Windows Virtual Desktop. And we can say it targets only the Windows Virtual Desktop service as well, um, with the condition that any iOS, Windows and Android devices must be marked compliant. So it means that they're enrolled in Intune and meet that specific compliance policy. Now we can grant access, but enforce MFA if the device is not connected to the trusted company network. So there's a lot of conditions we put in place there, but it's balancing out the security for the end user and productivity. So another example, right, is if we create a policy that this time, you know, so again, targets a group of users, we'll call them finance, and we target yeah, the application being at Business Central. So we can block access to this with the exception for the selected trusted network, right? And allow, so we allow access if the users are on the network, but prompt for MFA if the device isn't compliant. So what does this do? Well, if you try to log in from a network outside the office, your login will be denied, just outright stopped. If you're connected to, to the trusted network, so you know, on a device that is enrolled in Intune, um, you know, um, as the, and the device configuration matches that of the Intune policy, then you'll be granted access to Business Central. But for whatever reason, if you are connected to the office network, but you're using a personal device, then you'll be prompted for MFA before you can access Business Central. Yeah. These types of policies give you the control to meet those specific security requirements while not affecting the user's productivity. And finally up on the screen, point points right here is the self-service password reset portal, right? So provide your users with the ability to, to securely reset their own passwords by using an MFA prompt, phone call, or even custom security questions. You can even combine these to enforce the users to, to complete two, you know, two, two tests before they can reset the password. Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection, also known as APT, uh, provides protection across Exchange, Teams, SharePoint, and OneDrive. On screen is how APT works for an email protection, you know, for, you know, for threat analysts, for malicious URLs and attachments within the email. So first of all, you know, the um, email is received by the 365 serv servers. It's then processed by various antivirus engines. If it's suspicious, then the email um, yeah, attachment is exploded in a sandbox environment. If it's found safe, or, or more importantly, found not to be unsafe, then, then it's passed to safe links to process it again and ensure that the URL that's, that's within the email is safe to view. Data loss prevention, you know, so first of all, you know, is you, you create policies that determine what type of data you need to protect as a business. Out of the box, there's currently 42 um, pre-created policies. So, you know, this is across financial, medical, and privacy. On top of these, you can create your own custom policies, you know, to target the data that, that that's, that's shared either inside or outside your organization. So choose your action, block or report. There may, there may be many legitimate reasons you know, to share this type of content with external contacts. But if you do, you shouldn't share the document. You know, this is how you lose control of the data. You share a link to the document. Um, yeah, so as I said, you should share a link to the document yeah, so with the permissions for the intended recipients. 
you know, um, you know, and if it contains sensitive information, then the document should be protected with, you know, with, um, with Azure Information Protection and Azure Rights Management. You know, this this ensures the doc, in, um, the document can't be saved locally, edited, forwarded, or even printed, or even printed by by the recipient. You can also set expiry dates and revoke permissions, you know, to to that file. You know, um, information rights management, well, and encryption with sensitivity labels works by allowing users to specify the sensitivity of the email or document they're working with or sending. Rights management, well, you specify who can access the document and what permission they have. With sen with sensitivity labels, you can mandate that employees must add a label every time they send a document or save a document. Um, but but optionally, you can specify a default label, right? And then add the condition that if the that if the user lowers the sensitivity, they must provide justification. So let's say that your default label is called internal, and if someone changes that to public, well, based upon the ranking of those, public is. Um, so, so when the user changes it to public, they'll have to provide that justification to why this document is now public. So, with adding the power, the, the power, um, you know, with adding protection, so in, in, encryption is activated. So here's where you can specify, um, you know, the permissions either when the label is created or at the time the email is sent. So I'm going to do a short demo of you know, Azure inform Information Protection and Sensitive Labels in action. So I'm going to use, I'm going to use um, yeah, I'll use Outlook, uh, and I've already created some sensitivity labels, and I've already created some Exchange Transport rules. So it's it's configured that only users with so the so the internal label is is configured so that only users with specific um, you know, specified company domains can open those emails. If the email is forwarded or sent to an external user, maybe intentionally or by accident, they won't be able to view the content of the email you know, as they're not from that specified domain. I've also created a restricted label with protection that enables emails to be sent to an external user. So they'll be able to open the email by email, they'll be sent a one-time passcode, and when they receive the email, um, sorry, when they, when they then use that one-time passcode, they can then receive and view the email. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to send an email to our target user link, and we're going to chuck in a subject here. And we're going to accidentally add an external user. So this is a Gmail user here. So we're just going to add now, we'll make sure we've got a sensitive label assigned to this one. So we're going to choose internal only. Now our user over on the right here should receive this email. There we go, it's received it. It's also, we, we even got a little header and footer on this one as well. We can see over on the user on the right, that user that was sent to by the external account the gmail account yeah has been denied so it's going to it's got an exchange transport rule in place that actually looks for the header information for that sensitive label and blocks email from sending first time so I'm just going to do another one now so internal encrypted so this is a, a different type of internal policy Again, same users um, will will do the ex the external user again by accident. So, so we've got, got a little um, message up here that tells the user what the intention of these labels are. So we're going to receive an email again for our user on our right. This is an internal user that they're, they're both part of the perfect lab domain so again this user has received this email we put no contact no content in the body what we'll do now is we'll go back across to the external user 
So now this user has received a notification that I have an email. This isn't the email itself. So this user is going to click to read the message. This user, because it's not part of the domain or it doesn't have a 365 account associated to it, the way that they are going to utilize the 365 service is they get sent a one-time passcode. So let's go back to our inbox here. We should have been sent a one-time passcode. We'll just refresh this inbox. Just email's been a little bit slow. Okay, so here's our passcode. So we'll copy this passcode. We'll copy this passcode. <laughs> And now this is the point the user's basically authenticating with the um, with Azure Information Protection, and we're denied. This is because this user isn't part of that perfect lab domain. So that's two different ways of of looking at kind of internal um, internal sensitivity labels and Azure Information Protection. Different use cases for each. So just going to delete these emails here just to clean up for our next test, just so we don't get confused. So this time, again, so we're going to still now target the same users. Um, this time, it's going to be intentional. So we want to send our external user this email. So let's add our external user. So if we don't, so this time, we so we have no policy selected. We have no sensitive label selected. And we're just going to try and send this email. Now, this is where we have the policy in place to say we can't send an email without selecting a sensitive label. So we're going to click uh, click restricted. Now, restricted is going to put the same protection and encryption on, but with a different policy attached to it. So the encrypt, so the internal one was specified only people on the internal domain can access and read these emails. So internal user received the email. So we'll go across to our external user now. Just make that a bit bigger, just so you can see a bit more. So again, we've got the notification to say we've been sent an email. And we'll do one time passcode again. Copy the one time passcode again. You can try and use it, it won't work. And now this user can receive or, and can now view this email, even though they're external from the domain because it's restricted. So only people who receive the email can access it. And we can see that we've put the thing on here. We can't print, we can't forward, we can't copy content. But we can reply. So we're just going to reply now to this email. Okay, we'll minimize this and we'll go back to the catalog setting. And we'll see in a moment that the email from the Gmail user will pop in. It's still got protection. You can see the padlock on the email itself. And again, we can see here, receive things. So that's Azure Information Protection. So let's have a look how Azure Information Protection works in action. Yeah. So also called AIP. So first, you know, the user applies protection to the document and AI um, yeah, Azure Information Protection, ARP, encrypts the document and stores the key. 
So when the document is then sent off to say you use two here, user two tries to open the document, it goes back to Azure Information Protection. If that user is authenticated and can actually and, and is authorized to access that document, then AIP sends back the decryption key to the um, you know, to the document and then and now that user can 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 view that document and whatever permissions are applied to it by user one or by the by, by the label applies. So I'm just gonna pause for a minute there and just check for any any questions as well. So you've got a question come in here. So um, what if you want to send it to someone externally, but also need to send another um, incorrect person externally too? So can you restrict? Uh, can, can you restrict further so, so so that when so that only the intended external recipient um, gets the one-time passcode? So what you're able to do there? So I think what you're saying is if you if you do need to then say do that. Um, restricted policy that we looked at there if you did send it off to a second person who it wasn't intended to that's where you can actually go back in and you can actually change um you can actually revoke permission for the for that user that you sent it to incorrectly so even though you sent them the link it doesn't mean that they've always got the permissions because that's that's where the the rights management comes in where you, where you can then revoke their permission later on Um, another one here. So, so what was the difference between the two internal labels? So we had one called internal and one called internal encrypted. So the one that the one the one that was called internal didn't have any protection applied to it, right? So it didn't have any Azure Information Protection policies. What it did have was an Exchange Transport rule that was looking for the sensitivity label GUID in the email header. This then allows Exchange to block the email from being sent in the first place. The second was, you know, say, called internal encrypted. It had an Azure Information Protection policy applied, um, so that so the policy specified that users from the perfect lab domain could access emails. Um, so, but this so this is why the external user received the notification because they were sent the email, but they were unable to read the actual email because they couldn't be authenticated. Um, one other question is, do external users get prompted for, or I'm um, sorry, do all external users get prompted for one-time passwords? So this is a no. So if they have, if, so if the user has a Microsoft account or if they're, you know, associated with uh, Azure AD in some way, um, you know, they might have a hybrid environment, they, they, they may be using AD or the, you know, just a personal, even if it is that kind of personal um, Microsoft account, they won't be prompted as they already have that Microsoft kind of Azure AD presence. So it's only those accounts, like that Gmail account, that didn't have a Gmail, so that didn't have a Microsoft account associated with it. Okay, all right, we'll move on. Is that key? <coughs> So using the right Microsoft 365 license bundle, you know, um, yeah, it bundles in device management, identity security, and threat protection, you know, um, with the Office Productivity Suite as a complete solution. You know, it, from what we've just seen there, that, that starts as little as that feeling at 15 pound 10 for the Microsoft 365 business premium license. You know, you may even be able to save some money if you're on, if you're currently using Office 365 E3 purely for the shared activation services route. Right? because now the business premium license has that functionality. So these products can be purchased separately um, also and kind of added to other 365 plans. So the features that I've discussed um, are just a plan one offering, yeah, but they enable you the tools, but they don't provide the automation. The automation comes with generally the plan two options. Um, so, when you when you've got plan two in our or advanced security compliance this provides the automation so users no longer have to email 
um, you know, so no, no, no longer have to apply sensitive labels or classify documents. So using AI, Microsoft now does all the heavy lifting. You know, so you train the system, and from that point forward, Big Brother essentially decides what's sensitive. You know, it applies it applies the, the, the classifications. It decides what should be encrypted, what should be encrypted. Both Plan 1 and Plan 2, they've both got access to the reporting da um, dashboards, so you'll know what's been applied, and also you know, um, allows you to administer and continue to monitor uh, you know, tweak those policies, but importantly, you know where your sensitive data resides. You know who has access to it. If I if I asked you right now, could you tell me that you understand your data? You know, do you know where your data is? If you use sensitive data, and also who has access to it? So. Traditional versus modern workplace, right? So it's about technology, not about bean bags and bright office, open plan offices and colorful walls. It's about communication and collaboration. You know, businesses, um, businesses and their workforces are increasingly working more on the move, you know, out of the office and on a wide range of devices. This is a modern way of working and it's not usually suitable for restrictive on-premise infrastructures and legacy systems. It's about communication and collaboration, the ability to work from anywhere, anytime, from any device, and communicate and collaborate, um, collaborate with your teams and colleagues, just as if you're in the same room as them. It's a technology that enables the end users to work as a modern user, you know, not confined to the desk at the same location. Um, so it's also the ability for employees to set their own schedule, you know, freedom to work remotely. You don't need to limit your talent pool by requiring your employee to live in the same city, you know, same county, or even the same country as your, you know, as your office location. And also, you know, as companies have moved towards greater reliance on technology, you know, uh, more employees find themselves working even after the workday ends. To help with that, employers can offer employees the ability to choose their own hours you know, or provide work from home opportunities. Employees understand that employees are under pressure. You know, they, they understand that an employee who feels stressed and overworked is less likely to be productive. Instead of focusing on the hours in the office, companies are turning their focus towards deliverables and outcomes. By using technology, you, know, you no longer need to enforce your users are in the same building to collaborate. I have another quick demo here for co-authoring a Word document. So we've got four users where it will be signed in using different Windows virtual desktop environments. So using Chrome, Safari, Firefox browsers to access the Windows 10 desktop, um, all to work on the same document in, in real time. So I'm just going to share a document from this user here. I see now it's in OneDrive currently. Let's add a comment here. And this will come through on the email to the users. Okay, notification. Email or link has been sent. So now if we go to their mail, we should have an email in here, which will pop in any moment. There we go. If we click on the link, and this will actually open up the document in the Word on online version. So just quickly open up the other two desktop sessions and do the same here. So we'll open up the Word documents, just so we're all signed in. Okay, so we'll just get this one around here. We'll just sign in so to get the full experience. All right, so we'll just scroll down to the same section in the document so we all know where we're working. We'll start with by rights. Okay, so if we make a couple of changes here in this document, what we're going to do is see it's made the it's had an effect on the user left. Same for the user on the left, we'll highlight it, and we can see it immediately takes effect for the user on the right. 
So if we just go to our full Word version within our other two desktops. Now we can see what users are logged in. So it's showing two users because our other user is still opening the document. Once the user signs in, we can already see there it's flagged up. There are three users, but and we can see the third user on the right hand side has just popped in. So everyone's working on the document, or everyone who is working on the document is listed within either the full client or the web client. So I can see on the full client the changes have been made. And again, in the other user, the changes have been made as well. If we just scroll down to a random section within this document and we make a change, now if we want to know where this user is within this document, I'll just open up another window here just so we can actually do this properly. And we can click on the users, click on Westy, and this will take us to the location he's editing this document. Okay, one thing I didn't show you, and I'll just minimize all of this, is when we share the document in the first place, we can choose at the point of sharing the rights. So we can either allow editing on the document or make it read only. We can set the expiry date for when people will no longer be able to access, add a password, password protected even further. And we can block downloads. So we make it an online only. You must be connected to make these changes. Right, so I'll just check for any questions here. Um, yep, so got one here. So can I co-author offline when I don't have internet? Yes, you don't need the internet to be able to co-author. So when you go back online, you'll be notified of any changes that have been made to the document. Any changes you've made will be also will be synced with the other users. Uh, how many users can work on the document at the same time? Well, there's a soft limit of 10 users for co-authoring the same document at the same time. Um, it can be changed up to the hard limit of 99 users. And another one here, can I co-author with an Excel? Yes, co-authoring supported uh, with, with all modern file formats, so DocX, XLSS, um, PowerPoint as well, PPTX. So, um, so yeah, this was a virtual desktop environment, right? So to access the virtual desktop environment, you can use any Windows 10, Mac, uh, iOS, or Android device. You can even access the full desktop via the web browser, like we just saw. Well, our policies and rules can be created so, 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 they, so they can access the, the full desktop, you know, or only allow particular um, access to published applications. So we want to take away the user's ability to use the desktop itself. You, know, you, you can add those conditional uh, access policies, enforce MFA, um, you know, and ensure preventing files from being shared onto personal devices. You know, that's a big GDPR problem you want to avoid. Uh, two of the most popular cloud-based remote desktop and kind of virtual desktop solutions is Windows Virtual Desktop and Amazon Workspaces. Um, but in my opinion, Windows Virtual Desktop should be a first consideration if you don't already have a, you know, sorry, if, if, if you don't have a cloud presence already, and if you already have a 365 license. Um, if you want to learn more about Windows Virtual Desktop, I am having a dedicated session for this particular product uh, in, in two weeks. So it's, it's important to assess what cloud environment's right for you, right? So you, to start with, you need to assess you, you know, the current infrastructure and applications and look at other cloud ready. You know, should they be, be retired or replaced with a SaaS offering? You need to map your needs against your, um, um, your, your plans. You know, are, you, are you already using Office 365 and plan to grow and expand into, into other 365 services? If that's the case, then hosting virtual desktops with AWS compare, you know, will complicate the matter. You know, it will lead to more management. There'll be additional costs over, over using um, Microsoft's WBD offering. Likewise, if you already have your workloads in AWS, then why would you use Windows Virtual Desktop? You know, sometimes there are good reasons and you may have a multi-cloud strategy, but it's important for us not to assume, but to review, you know, dis, uh, you know discuss, offers it. You know, and offer a solution, not a product. So we want to, we, you know, so, so we need to discuss the cloud options. 
hosting versus serverless. You know, as we move away from infrastructure, uh, you know, infrastructure as a service to platform as a service, the resilience these options bring increase, but also along with lower support costs. We also need to understand budget, right? All parties need to understand what the budget is to ensure the solution can be delivered that meets your requirements, but not impede growth, right? And one of them, because one of the main benefits of cloud is that is that agility and flexibility to change. So Perfect Image has partnered with Exponential E to provide our customers with connectivity, you know, hosted telephony, uh, and connected solutions with direct routing to Teams, you know, um, but using the Exponential E you know, for the calling plan. By using a direct routing partner, we can provide you know, they can provide savings of up to ninety no, of ninety percent compared to the Microsoft calling plans. If you have on-premise PBX phone systems, you know, whilst the users are out of the office, they generally can't utilize the current phone system. You know, it's, it's essentially useless. Also on-premise or, or, or legacy phone systems, you know, they, they've got limitations in functionality, you know, um, and the growth is, is limited compared with cloud hosted options, you know, where all you need is an internet connection to utilize. You don't even need a physical handset anymore. So you can use a soft phone. So it's an application that's either on your mobile phone, your tablet, or your Windows PC. You know, using either a hosted telephony solution or integration within Teams provides all the benefits that you currently see on the screen. So just want to point out, right, so the subscription model. So with, with those cloud-based services, again, you pay for what you use on a per user per month based on the subscription model that fits your business. Hosted um, telephony solutions cost between 10 and 15 pounds per user per month. Um, and it ends about six pounds per month if you want to go with the team side for the add-on license. Yeah, so when you when using Teams as your telephony as, as, as a as a telephony solution, the calling plans from Microsoft cost around nine pounds per user compared to using the direct routing partner, like exponentially, then the calling bundle is reduced to about three pounds per user per month. So we know your business is likely to, to, to need remote work technologies for a while yet. So what does a secure you know, uh, remote working solution look like? No one would have been able to work from home successfully and, and, and product, uh, um, you know, without using some form of cloud technology. You know, maybe Gmail, Zoom, WhatsApp, Office 365, they're all cloud kind of services. Just like any other offering, public cloud is secure as long as you have that knowledge on how to correctly configure, administer, and, de and deploy these services. But with public cloud, you only pay for what you use. Your IT, your IT teams have less responsibility, responsibilities to manage the underlying hardware and systems. It also has strong disaster recovery and business continuity options that you simply couldn't afford to build, manage, and have that life cycle of hardware replacements in data, in data centers, you know, yeah, and have those costs just for that just in case emergency. Cloud providers have data centers all over the world. So if an earthquake is uh, yeah, impacts the whole of the UK, you know, AWS or, or, or Microsoft Azure's global services will continue to run. And depending upon the services that you're consuming or, or, or you've got configured, you'll either be able to recover all of your all your business files, systems, and documents, or carry on working as if nothing happened. Or if a global pandemic hits, your staff can continue to work from home just as they did before and everything they need to do their office. Um, staff should be able to use any device. Yeah, so you, it could be, could be their own um, device in conjunction with a BYD policy or works la la laptop, you know, mobiles and tablets. They should be able to work from anywhere at any time. There's no reason why this can't be as efficient and as easy and secure as working from from the laptop in their in their office, you know, on on, on your network. Cloud-based access to documents. So this could be document storage like OneDrive or a con comprehensive document manage management solution like SharePoint. Utilizing Microsoft 365 product suite and services. Yeah, so, so utilizing Teams as your communication or video conferencing solution. All these parts together make a fantastic solution that will help you manage any difficult situation your, your business faces 
and importantly, access securely and manage your compliance requirements. So here's my wrap up of what you can expect in the second half of the year, right? How to prepare. Um, so email security, continue training and reinforce with simulated phishing attacks on users. And document security, implement a robust you know, application and device security, device security. Use all the features that you have available to you with the likes of Microsoft 365. Secure your users' cloud identities. Your identity is the gateway to your resources and your data. So operate in a zero trust model. Enforce MFA. Uh, applications uh, in data security. Understand your data, right? So know what's sensitive, know where it is, know who has access to it. Otherwise, how can you protect it? Uh, so, so, yeah, cyber security attacks are on the rise. Make sure your systems are protected. Um, get the staff are trained, you know, and on high alert. So, Perfect Image, you know, is offering incentives and free consultations to support our customers develop their remote work first work workforce. If your business is experiencing challenges or pains, uh, you know, with remote working, or you have concerns with your security and compliance, please get in touch. You know, we're offering some free consultations for UK businesses at the minute, and we'll have a chat about the issues you're facing, you know, what you want to achieve, and how we can help to fulfill your goals. Our job is to turn business problems into technical solutions. So I hope today's webinar has given you some insights into the future of remote working and how you can prepare. So I'll just do a final check to see if there are any more questions. Uh, so what's your top number one tip for IT security? Uh, implement MFA, definitely get MFA. In, in, in enforced for all your users for your applications. Um, another one. So, what license do you need for conditional access policies? So, you require Azure AD P1, right? So, this comes with most of the Microsoft 365 plans, so not the Office 365 plans, but it is also available as a standalone purchase. Uh, I think we've got one final question here. So you have not mentioned privileged identity management as part of you know, user's identity and security. So that's true. So I haven't. Um, I couldn't fit everything into the session. Uh, I've already gone over by 15 minutes, so I do apologize for that. But so privileged identity management, or PIMS for short. So it is part of the um, Azure AD P2 license or the um, kind of E5 bundlings. So this starts to go into the world of Azure and RBAC, so role-based access control. It's a fantastic product, and it's around limiting access to those privileged accounts. So it forms part of best practice, right? So not having the users' accounts that people use on a day-to-day -day with privileges such as security admin or you know, global admin, it requires the users to request access for a period of time before then that permission is revoked. Um, what I'll do is I'll follow, I'll follow up with you after the session and dig a little deeper around your requirements. Okay, that is it. Uh, thank you very much for attending.